Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is our review of Chapter 14, Biotechnology and Genomics. I'm super proud of the kids that showed up, so there would be a review today. Say hey. Hi. Hey. All right. So let's go over big ticket items, okay? So cloning is making identical copies. That part's easy. We talked about that cloning can happen naturally, but what we focused on was cloning of a gene. And so there are different strategies you can do to clone a gene. Um, and why might you want to clone a gene? You, you might want to look for if there's an error or if there's a problem, right? Um, maybe you want to change the phenotype. Like in our, you, you might want to change the phenotype of a bacterium so it starts producing human insulin, right? So that might be something you would alter. Maybe you're trying to obtain some protein. So those are just some big ticket items you might want to do. Um, we, we're going to talk about gene therapy at the end, so I'm going to skip over that. Two procedures used to clone DNA. One is recombinant DNA technology. If I'm gonna recombine something, if I'm gonna rearrange this one and this one's genes, I have to be able to do what to the gene? I have to be able to cut the DNA. My FOSS kids, can I have you move over to the lab benches because otherwise it's a little bit distracting when you're doing that? Okay, so you have to be able, and then my AP kids, can you fill in the gap please and come forward? Thank you. A little rearrangement because we're not just bunches of fun here. That's how we roll. What do you have on your shirt? Are those cats? Oh my Sushi gosh. Cats. Sushi cats? What's up with that? Because my Boji always gives me examples where I can put myself in sushi. So what's going on with that? Why would I want to be in sushi? Yeah, but I know that I don't want to be in sushi. Do you want to be in sushi? I want to be in sushi. I'm gonna have, I'm gonna put that bit emoji on, and we'll see who watched it. We'll say, what did Miss Litton? Okay, <laughs> put it, you missed it. If you were here earlier, you know. Um, okay, so anyway, when you want to uh, manipulate DNA, you have to be able to cut it. What do we use to cut DNA? Restriction enzymes. And see if you can remember this. Restriction enzymes cut at a specific series of. Sorry, I have a meeting today and somebody's telling me they can't come. Okay. Restriction enzymes cut at a specific series of bases um, and called the what? No, that's after you cut them. Called, what do you call that specific series of bases you're looking for? It starts with an R. Recog recognition sequence. The recognition sequence is the series of bases that it cuts at. Once you cut it, there are different ways to cut it. Remember we said you could do a blunt cut, but better still is to come in, across, and back out, staggered cut, and now you create what? Sticky, sticky ends. If you have complementary sticky ends, you can mix and match DNA. And of course the hydrogen bonds are gonna hold them together, but you have to seal the phosphate sugar backbone, so that's gonna require what? Ligase. Ligase, okay? So cut with restriction enzymes at recognition sequence, cut it in a staggered cut, so you create sticky ends. Sticky ends will be attracted to each other and you seal the phosphate sugar backbone with ligase. A second procedure is polymerase chain reaction. And if I was gonna simplify polymerase chain reaction, I'd say it's a DNA what? Photocopier. Photocopier, makes more DNA. Why would I ever wanna have more DNA than what I have to start out with? Maybe I wanna test it. Maybe I wanna make some comparisons, right? Okay, so we looked at our glowfish. Um, you have to have some sort of vector to get DNA into something, and there are two common vectors. One is the one on the screen, which is a what? Plasmid. The plasmid is the vector. You can put it in a bacterium, but the plasmid is the vector. What's the second vector you could use? You get a cold maybe because you caught a virus. Plasmids and viruses are your two main vectors. Plasmids and viruses, okay? So. Um, we talked about restriction enzymes. This, where they're cutting, is the recognition sequence, the series of bases. And when they cut, this is a staggered cut that creates those sticky ends. And if I have complementary sticky ends, I can mix my match and mix and match my DNA. I just need to seal it um, with some ligase in order to combine it together. I could be manipulating a plasmid. I could be manipulating RNA. I could be manipulating DNA that I'm putting into a, a viral host um, and then putting it into another organism in that way. So the cloning part would come about is if 
once that DNA is in that host, every time that host makes a copy of itself, if it has a plasmid in it, it's going to make a copy of that same um, 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 plasmid, or I'm trying to think of the word, recombinant DNA that's found in that plasmid. And so I can grow that organism, in this case E. coli, up in an environment, um, and then I could harvest that product, that protein product that it would make. Now, hopefully, and we've learned about how we control gene expression, you want to have a way to turn that gene on and, it, you know, and, and also to turn it off. So you get it to express it at some point, so then you can harvest it and collect it. Okay, and we talked about when if you take a, a eukaryotic um, chromosome and you cut a piece out of it and you put it into a prokaryotic cell, you have to keep in mind that prokaryotes operate differently in gene expression. And so we talked about the importance that it um, has to have bacterial regulatory regions, a way that turns that gene on. Okay? The second thing is we can't have any introns because bacteria don't have any <laughs> snurping capabilities. So you have to give them a clean copy. A way to get a clean copy is to use a cl your clean mRNA that would be used for translation, work backwards to synthesize DNA using the enzyme reverse transcriptase, work backwards, and replicase to make it double-stranded, and then insert it. Okay, and you, to insert it, you need some sort of vector. And what were our two vectors? Plasmids. Viruses or plasmids, good. Questions or concerns on that first part? All right, so let's move on to um, PCR. And again, maybe you have a crime scene and you only have a small sample of DNA that you want to harvest. So the key elements to a thermocycler, which is how you do the polymerase chain reaction, is the first thing you have to do is once you've found your DNA, maybe you mark it or tag it, so you have a certain region that you want, you're going to have to do something to it to make it single-stranded. What are you going to do to make it single-stranded? Heat it up. You have to provide primers that are going to go right around the section that you want to amplify. And you need to have what else in there? What, the bases? So you're saying, yeah, you got to have your nitrogenous bases. You have to have your nucleotides. And then that gives you time. Remember, both of them are going to be leading strands because they can work off either end. And your primer is going to tag that gene that you want to amplify. Heat it up again. Repeat the whole process. And over you know, a few hours, you can have millions of copies of that particular DNA. Now, the, the one concern we would have is in that heating cycle where you get it really hot to denature it, it could denature the enzymes that you're using. So that's why they use DNA polymerase that's been isolated from what? <coughs> what? Yeah, no, the, the DNA polymerase that you're going to use is going to come from Archaea, Thermus Aquaticus, because it can withstand the heating and cooling cycles because it's coming from an extremophile, right? Okay. All right. Um, then we said, okay, now maybe I want to analyze that DNA that I have made multiple copies of because I can't see it in its test tube. So now to visualize the DNA that I have, Okay, I am again, I could be using restriction enzymes to cut the DNA up in spe specific locations, right? And I'm going to load that DNA that's been cut into um, a gel uh, that because I want to do gel electrophoresis. And the gelatin is really, really expensive jello. And I load it into the divots of the gelatin. And you did this last year. The gelatin is submerged in a solution that can carry a current. And you turn a charge on, and the DNA will start to move through the gel electrophoresis box because the DNA is charged what? What's the charge on DNA? Negative because of the phosphate groups. And it'll be attracted to the positive end. So you've got to load it in the right way. I've loaded gels in backwards before and run them right off the other end, which is super disappointing. Um, now the way they make boxes, you have to really screw up to do that. You know, it's like you can only load it in a certain way. But initially it wasn't, so... It, it was actually a student who did it, but I didn't see that they had loaded it in wrong, and it was very sad to get to this big point of it. And instead of like going this way, it went right off the end and into the water. So, but you won't do that. You will do it correctly, okay? And when you do that, you start to see these banding patterns. Um, the banding patterns are only there because you provide some stain that um, uh, connects with the DNA, and then it helps you to vis visualize it. And we can predict fragment lengths and we can compare fragment lengths, 
and we could identify victims of a crime or a perpetrator of a crime. We could um, look at phylogeny and evolutionary history and make comparisons. We could study mitochondrial DNA, which is kind of interesting because it's only inherited through the what? Mom. Mom. Right. Okay, and um, then the next part we did was all about biotech. And um, this is basically now that we know the steps of how to manipulate DNA and analyze it, how can we use it to serve our purposes um, to make some product that we want. And one of the organisms that's used quite a bit prolifically is bacteria. That's easy. Nobody gets upset when you use bacteria. And they're getting bacteria to make a lot of our um, drugs that we need. Um, and so it's a human protein made by bacteria. And uh, they grow them in these great big bioreactors or get them to degrade oil we talked about or mining. Um, you can also genetically engineer plants. That's a little more tricky because it's not unicellular, it's multicellular, and it has a nucleus, right? Bacteria don't. You throw a plasmid inside of a bacterium, it's gonna get transcribed and translated. We've got to get the genes in the cell and inside the nucleus. So this a lot of times it involves removing a nucleus or changing it and replacing it, and that's a little bit um, trickier to do but can be done, and they're looking at different ways of genetically engineering crops, maybe so that they use less water, or you can water them with salt water instead of fresh water because we have so much more salt water than we do have fresh water, or they make multiple products that we might need, or it's enriched, or it has some drugs or medicine. Yes? Um, is a genetically modified plant, or like a genetically modified bacteria considered transgenic? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, so we looked at that, and then, Genetically modifying or, or making a transgenic animal, that's a pretty big deal. You know, especially, again, it's multicellular. People get upset when you start messing with animals. Plants are not like, oh my gosh, you were mean to the fern. Okay, most people don't get upset about that. But they do if you are bothering cats or other organisms. So that part's a little bit trickier. Again, we've got a nucleus to deal with. But you can get more product. If you have a multicellular organism, you can really harvest a lot more product. Um, once you get it formed, um, you might have to, um, you know, put in, either inject some DNA or, you know, in, in order to get it in the nucleus or replace the nucleus. Um, they're looking also uh, maybe not going to the nuclear level to get it to produce some product, but maybe if we can't just do it in a lab situation instead of using a whole living organism that might, you know, but we're still using eukaryotic cells that we've modified. Um, that may be the way to go as well. Um, we talked about um, the Siri gene and how they put that in and they, they made a female mouse ma male. Um, we talked about, I think we talked about knockout mouse where they can genetically engineer these mice to have some of our diseases and then we can test them because usually people are better with us testing them on mice than people. And yeah. And then um, next we talked about gene therapy. So these are kind of easy because of their names, um, ex vivo, in vivo. So ex vivo, you're removing some cells, altering them, and returning them. The benefit of that is it's not going to be rejected because it's your own cells that you're modifying. Um, in vivo is somehow you've got to get this modified um, DNA into your cells, maybe through in, an inhalant that goes into your lungs. Um, and gets in through your body that way, some sort of injection, maybe something in the bone marrow, something to get that, again, it's difficult. If it's just a problem with one set of cells, you could maybe change that one set of cells and make it better. Um, you've heard of stem cell transplants, right? So in stem cell transplants, they're taking out your own bone marrow that are screwed up and producing um, too many cells, but you have to eradicate all of your own bone marrow and replace it with somebody else's. In this case, what they would do is they're removing your own bone marrow, fixing it, and returning it, hoping that will take over. Okay, so that's ex vivo and in vivo. Um, then we talked about um, genomics. And I went into a lot of detail, probably more than you would need on that. But when we talk about um, genomics, it's more than just sequencing the basis, though that was the first step, making comparisons between um, different organisms. There's the um, HapMap project where you're really comparing DNA between 
different cultures, right? Different people. Why do these drugs impact this or not impact them? Why is this person more susceptible to a disease than another person? So they are analyzing DNA by region. Um, they started looking at um, um, SNPs, um, um, single nucleotide polymorphisms, where there's variations just from one nucleotide, and how does that play out? Um, and you and I have talked about this when it goes wrong. This could be a very not, you know, nominal, not causing any problem, or it could be a major problem by just changing one single nucleotide. Um, and then, really, the big research now is that in, there's intergenic, right, and, and intragenic regions. And if it's in an area that is a coding region, um, then, you know, within the gene, um, no problem. Um, intragenic, then that's going to code for a particular pro um, product, some protein potentially, but it's the spacers in between the genes that look to have a lot of control in them as well. And maybe it's affecting the way the DNA is available for transcription or translation. Some epigenetic inheritance um, could be altering that as well. And this, yeah, in intergenic in between those spacers. Um, we looked at how little of our DNA is actually expressed, but some of these could be failed evolutionary attempts, some could be due to transposomes, or they could have a really large impact on control that we haven't really quite realized yet. A genetic profile, especially if you're in second, the third period, I don't think I hit this as well, so let me make sure I hit this now. Basically what they're doing is they would have a computer chip that had single-stranded DNA in it for every disease out there. Okay, so sections, like a genetic library of diseases. And then you could take your DNA and cut it up into sections and flood that chip. I'm simplifying this, obviously. Flood that chip, and wherever it bands, binds, that means it's complementary to it, and the only way it could be complementary to it is if you have that messed up gene which matches then another messed up gene, right, that's on the computer chip. And then that would light up, and from what lit up, they could say whether or not you're more susceptible to one disease or another. So you could find that out as soon as you're born. <laughs> Analysis. And I believe that is where it will go. If we have the technology to fix it, or if you can do something about it, right? You can test right now to see if you're gonna have a Tysex baby, but you can't undo the Tysex problem. You, you are going to get it, right, um, in that child. But, you know, hopefully it will lead when you, you have a, sometimes it could be a better awareness of conditions um, so that you can avoid whatever that disease is. Like you can avoid getting PKU if you get tested for it and you realize you have a mutation for it, you can avoid certain foods and then you won't end up getting PKU. Okay, so hopefully that will lead to other discoveries. Um, proteomics is you're studying proteins. We discussed this in class. That's a huge, you know, the DNA can have everything right, but you could end up having the way it's folded be incorrect or making sure that you have um, the right chaperone proteins to correct these mistakes. Um, bioinformatics, putting into computers to analyze that information, that's a whole huge field of study, which if we had lots of quantum computers, that would be really cool because it could handle a lot of information. That's a little ways off. Um, and then realizing that the genome is, is, is multi-dimensional, right? Because it's not just the genes that code for the proteins, but we need to look at the spaces that interrupt it. That's also equally important. Um, and any proteins that might adhere to the DNA that it'll interfere with any kind of transcription or translation are also important. So it's not just the genome that we need to analyze, but all the control and the interspersed um, sections. And, um, and there's, that's a big, huge field of study. And I don't think I asked you these questions, the last ones. Let's see how many questions there are. Let me remove these students. B, um, your favorite sandwich. I kind of remember that for class on Thursday. That would be a good one. We haven't done that one. We're beta testing favorite sandwich. I'm going to look for Winnie Witch because somebody will say that. What's an Italian BMT? What's BMT? <laughs> I know bacon, lettuce, and tomato. But... 
Winnie Witch, see, I told you that would be there. <laughs> oh, I think I asked you these. Are there quite why people are finishing that? Are there some gaptosis in the learning that you need me to go over or review? That's a pretty good time. Who did that? Did I finish it? You did it? Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> she's, gonna, she's practicing because she's going to be a tattoo artist. <laughs> College is expensive. You make some bank that way. <laughs> I'm not saying to get tattoos. Okay, let's go over it. Okay, gene therapy is a uh, still investigated procedure, makes use of viruses to carry foreign genes into human cell. That is true. It has met with success. Um, and this said had met with no success. Um, what is the benefit of using a retrovirus as a vector in gene therapy? Um, it if you use a retrovirus, it'll take the RNA version that you gave, the retrovirus, and it has the enzymes, or it doesn't carry the enzymes, but it can ma make its own um, reverse transcriptase. You take the RNA, convert it to DNA, and then it has integrates, it'll insert it into the host cell chromosome. And so that's, you're using the viral's normal replication procedures to basically be a genetic engineer, a little micro genetic engineer into fix your cells. So that would be the benefit of a retrovirus. Questions, concerns, issues? Anything you need me to go over again? Okay, you did awesome, done. Thank you. Have a piece of toast. Get ready for your quiz on Thursday, super smarties. 22 minutes of fun.